Amen. Thanks, folks. You can have a seat. I know that some of you are very curious people by nature, and as such, you probably wonder what it is that a pastor does all week long, right? Now admit it, you probably wondered, what in the world does he do all week? Well, let me just give you a little bit of insight if I can this morning. This week I was in my office and I was doing some heavy thinking. How come everybody's laughing already? I hear the Snickers. I was doing some really deep, really heavy thinking about bacon and eggs. I love bacon and eggs. I I really do. Nice, crisp bacon. It's got to be, if it's soggy, I'm out. But if it's crisp, You know, two or three eggs scrambled up, a little butter in the frying pan. Oh, that tastes so good. I love it. And I was thinking about that this week. I was hungry, as you might imagine. I was thinking about how good it would be to have a big heaping plate of it. And then not long after that, I started thinking about the Lone Ranger and Tonto. That's an appropriate segue, right? You know Lone Ranger and Tonto. Some of you may be familiar with all you young people out there with the movie that just came out last year. I'm thinking about the old show that I used to watch the reruns of uh, after school in the afternoons, okay? And then after that, I started thinking about fish and chips. I don't know why it always comes back to food, but it does. Nice, (laughs) Nice big slab of haddock with crispy batter on it. And then I was thinking about Abbott and Costello, and Batman and Robin, and Ben and Jerry. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, why do we pay this guy to do this? No, you're thinking the same thing I was. What do all of these famous tandems have in common? Right? You know what they all have in common? They all have in common the fact that one would not be the same without the other. You have to have both. You have to have both of those things. Can you imagine Ben without Jerry? He would have just been a guy in a van driving around trying to figure out what to do with his life. Instead, they came together and made one of the most delicious things on the face of the earth. One is not the same without the other. And life is kind of like that sometimes. I don't know if your brain works the way mine does. Probably not. But if it did, you would realize that life is like that sometimes too. There has to be, we have to strike a balance in a lot of areas in our lives, don't we? Let's, Let's think about a couple of them. How about the balance between work and rest? Okay, work is great. We should work hard. In fact, the Bible challenges us to work hard and Use what we've been given. But if you work all the time and don't get any rest, what happens? You get burned out. You can't do anything. Rest is good. I love my bed. I love my pillow. I love spending time there. But if all I did was rest, right, that's not good either. How about the balance between saving and spending? We would all say saving is good. But if all you do is save and you never spend any of it on the things that you need, that can be very bad, right? How about thinking about your role as parents, for those of you who are parents and grandparents? How about the balance between disciplining your children and giving them some freedom so that they can learn how to take care of themselves? You see, in every area of life, going too far in one direction can spell disaster. And the same is true in our spiritual lives as well. I don't know if I should ask this question or not, but how many people remember way back in June, I can see all of you dropping out of the race already. Ray, way back in June, we talked about James chapter 2. We talked about faith and works. And we talked about that balance there. And James says, you've got to have faith, you've got to trust God, 
But if it doesn't result in a change in your life, then what good is it? It's useless. We're going to kind of tie that in with our look at Nehemiah and Jonah. Now, the last two Sundays, we haven't been here, but I know that Pastor Tim has been talking about Nehemiah chapter 1 and Jonah chapter 1. I listened to them online and uh, so I could stay caught up with you guys. We've been talking about that, and we've been talking about answering God's call. Nod your head if you agree from those two weeks. There are two different ways to answer God's call, right? Yeah. Two very different situations between Nehemiah's response and Jonah's response. So obviously we need to answer God's call, but how do we answer it? What is the, what is the, the principles or what are the principles that we use to answer God's call in our lives in a way that honors Him? Obviously we want to do that. Obviously we want to answer like Nehemiah did and not how Jonah did. I want to suggest to you this this morning. The answering God's call must be a combination of faith and action, okay? Answering God's call must be a combination of faith and action. We're going to see that in this chapter. It's all through it in Nehemiah chapter 2. That's where we're going to be this morning. And as we do that, I want you to consider your life and your situation, okay? I know sometimes when we hear really good advice, the first thing we think of is everyone else in our lives that really needs that advice and could use it. But I'm going to challenge you to resist that urge this morning and think about your life, okay? Think about where you are right now. Even if you say, well, Mike, I, I'm, I'm living for God. I'm honoring God. I'm doing what He wants me to do. Just humor me. And think about your life. Think about where you are right now because we're going to notice a few things from Nehemiah's response that I think we can apply to our lives. Let's look at the first three verses of Nehemiah. <clears throat> Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1 says this, Early the following spring in the month of Nisan, during the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I was serving the king his wine. I had never before appeared sad in his presence. Now, I don't want to redo everything that Tim has done. And I couldn't either, and neither could we. Have you ever seen when he comes up here and he drops his notes on the floor? There's like five words scribbled on that page. Okay, He probably couldn't replicate it either, but I'm not going to replicate all that. Because he already covered the stuff. But remember that Nehemiah was a slave. And he served the king personally. He was in the throne room to the king. He was his cupbearer. That means he was the the wine taster, the food taster, to make sure that nobody had poisoned the stuff that was being given to the king. So this is where Nehemiah is. So verse 2, so the king asked me, why are you looking so sad? You don't look sick to me. You must be deeply troubled. Then I was terrified, but I replied, long live the king. How can I not be sad? For the city where my ancestors are buried is in ruins and the gates have been destroyed by fire. By the way, when I said that's the way that Tim speaks, I wasn't knocking him. I was just saying I couldn't possibly do that. If you look at my notes, I have everything written out that we're going to say here this morning or else I'd be lost. So Nehemiah is with the king. He's terrified. I want you to realize this. or know, This is what I want you to notice out of this section. That Nehemiah was fearful... But that didn't stop him from pursuing the mission that God had given him. Okay, did you get that? Nehemiah was fearful, but it didn't stop him from pursuing the mission that God has given him. You see there in verse 2, it says that he was terrified. He was a slave. And he's coming into the presence of the king. He has this burden on his heart, and he knows, because of his position, that the king could do whatever he wanted. Now, I don't know if any of you, how many of you have ever read the book of Esther in the Bible or know the story of the book of Esther? Okay, this was the same king. If you know the story of Esther, one day the king, Artaxerxes, or Xerxes sometimes he's called, was having a big party with all of his best buds and his wife, whose name was Vashti, 
was incredibly beautiful. And so he said, Vashti, come in here and dance around in front of all my friends and let them see how beautiful you are. <laughs> I don't know if there was any kind of women's rights movement back then or not, but Vashti said, forget it, pal. I'm not dancing to your drum. And so Xerxes said, you know what? You're out. And he had a year-long beauty contest of all of the young women in the land to pick a new queen. This is the guy that Nehemiah is standing in front of right now with his knees knocking together. The guy who he knows at a moment's notice could kick out or kill anyone in his kingdom. Nehemiah is terrified, but he also knew that God had given him a task. Now, when I think about my life, and remember, you're thinking about your life, right? Nod your head if you're still with me. If you're not, it's going to be a long 20 minutes, okay? Sometimes it's scary to answer God's call. Sometimes it's scary because answering God's call, walking with God, serving Him, has a cost. It costs us something. This is a very, this is really a relatively minor thing in our walk with God, in our relationship with God, but let's talk about even coming here this morning. There was a cost for you to come here this morning. It cost you a few extra minutes of sleep. And I can see some of you, that might have been an iffy decision. I get it. It costs us to answer God when He calls to us. And sometimes that can be scary. So we can think, what if I fail? What if I am rejected? What if I am humiliated? Here's what I want you to get here before we go on to the next few verses. God calls us into this relationship with Him. He pursues us. If you have a relationship with Jesus Christ here this morning, I want you to know something. You have that relationship because God pursued you. He came after you. He wanted you. When we were much younger... I pursued Melody. I wanted a relationship with her. She was not as sure as I was. If I had waited for her to come to me, <laughs> we probably would never have had a relationship. But I knew that she was the one, and I pursued her. God knows He wants you. He knows He wants to have a relationship with you, and so He pursues you. And when He does that and draws you to Himself, and you come to the place in your life where you trust Him as your Savior, where you receive that gift of salvation, and I understand that some of you may not be at that point yet, and you don't have that relationship, I understand that. But I want you to know that when you get to that point that you trust Christ as your Savior, that is the beginning of the relationship, not the end of the journey. Okay? You get that? That is the beginning of your relationship. That is only the start of what God wants in your life. And Nehemiah knew that. He knew he had called him and given him a mission, much like he has given us a mission. He hasn't given us a mission to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, but he has given us a mission to reach out to the poor and to the needy and to those around us who do not know the truth of who Jesus Christ is. That's our mission that he has given to us. And we must not be fearful of the cost. You see that hinge word at the beginning of verse 3? He said, I was terrified. But, but, I replied, and he made his request. 
We need to be convinced of the call of God on our lives. Let's look at verse 4. The king asked, well, how can I help you? So with a prayer to the God of heaven, I replied, if it please the king and you are pleased with me, your servant, send me to Judah to rebuild the city where my ancestors are buried. The king with the queen sitting beside him asked, how long will you be gone and when will you return? After I told him how long I would be gone, the king agreed to my request. I also said to the king, if it please the king, let me have letters addressed to the governors of the province west of the Euphrates River, instructing them to let me travel safely through their territories on my way to Judah. And please give me a letter addressed to Asaph, the manager of the king's forest, instructing him to give me timber. I will need it to make beams for the gates of the temple fortress, for the city walls, and for a house for myself. And the king granted these requests because the gracious hand of God was on me. I want you to notice this, that Nehemiah was bold in his pursuit of the mission because he knew that God was with him, directing him. Nehemiah was bold in his pursuit of the mission. Now, now think again about Nehemiah's position. What was Nehemiah? A slave. He was nobody. He had no rights in this court. And he knew what the king could do. But when the king asked, he said, well, you could send me back so I could fix this place up. If you wouldn't mind, I'm going to need some travel documents. And if we're going to do the work, we really need the materials. So maybe you could send a letter to the guy that looks after the forests and have him prepare a bunch of wood for us to take with us too. I think that's pretty bold for a slave, don't you? To come into the presence of the king. Now, here's what I want you to know. This is, the, this is the key out of this section that I just want you to notice. Nehemiah was not being arrogant. He was being bold because he knew who God was. Okay? There's a big difference. Nod your head if you know anybody who is arrogant. You know what arrogance looks like, right? I can do this. Back off. Step out of the way. I got stuff to do. This is not arrogance. Look at what verse 8 says right at the very end. The king granted these requests because the gracious hand of God was on me. I want to challenge you this morning, when I, when I look out here, when I stand up here on Sunday mornings and I look out and I see you guys, you know what I see? I see the vast potential of what God wants to do in this community through us. I don't just see a bunch of people, I see a bunch of people that God is enabling and empowering to do His work. To build his kingdom. That's what I see. And we need to have that boldness that comes from knowing who it is that is sending us. I don't want you to be arrogant. I don't want you to strut out into the community and say, Here I am, you lucky people, and this is what we're going to do. I don't want you to do that. But I do want you to walk out into this community and know beyond the shadow of a doubt that Almighty God is the one who is sending you out there. And He is not going to send you out there with a task without supplying the raw materials that you need to do the job. He didn't challenge Nehemiah to go and then say, well... It's going to take a lot of material, and you may get your head lopped off when you go through enemy territory, but good luck to you. He said, no, Nehemiah, this is your job, and I'm sending you out there, and I'm going to give you everything that you need to get that job done. Lots of you have been asking <clears throat> Tim and I about the building. 
community center, a place for us to meet. You may have driven up and down High Street and seen the piles of brush and everything, and everybody says, so are we going to do it? Are we going to do it? How are we going to do it? Where are we going to get the money from? Well, Tim and Robert and I often sit around and <clears throat> pool all of our wisdom, right? It's not a real big pool, but pool all of our wisdom, and do you know what we say? Well, if God wants to have us have a building, he'll provide the resources to build the building, right? We are going to be bold in doing what God wants us to do in this community, whether it's building a building, whether it's reaching out to those that are needy around us, whether it is sharing Christ with someone we meet on the street, because we know that Almighty God is the one who has given us the task. Look at verse 11. Nehemiah says, so I arrived in Jerusalem three days later. I slipped out during the night, taking only a few others with me. I had not told anyone about the plans God had put in my heart for Jerusalem. We took no pack animals with us except the donkey I was riding. After dark, I went out through the valley gate, past the jackal's well, and over to the dung gate to inspect the broken walls and the burned gates. Then I went to the fountain gate into the king's pool, but my donkey couldn't get through the rubble. So though it was still dark, I went up to the Kidron Valley, instead inspecting the wall before I turned back and entered again at the valley gate. Sorry about this. I don't know what's happening. <clears throat> Losing it. Here's what I want you to notice here. That Nehemiah was honest in his assessment of the scope of the mission. He was honest in his assessment of the scope of the mission. He knew that Jerusalem was a mess, okay? Broken walls and burned gates, and this was going to be a huge task. And I think it's incredibly important for us as the church to be fully aware of the vastness of the task that God has set before us. Do you ever watch the news? Do you ever read the Sun Journal? Do you ever read the headlines of what's going on? Not just in our world, but in our state, in our communities. I think you'll agree with me that there is a huge task in front of us, right? I know it's possible that some people in talking to me, and I, I try to veil this as much as I can, but that I might be a little cynical. Tim thinks I'm cynical. I say I'm realistic. <laughs> I am realistic about the fact that we have a huge task that God has given us. It's big. There's a lot of work to do. The world is a mess. Our lives are a mess. And I think it's important for us that we don't live in a fantasy world. This is one of those things, I say this once in a while, that's going to sound really strange coming from a pastor. We need to make sure that we are not so spiritual that we lose touch with what's going on around us. You've heard us say many times, we don't want to become closed in. We don't want it to be all about what's happening in this room. We don't want to put blinders on and say, well, I've just got to circle the wagons and protect my own and not let the big bad world get in. We need to be careful that we understand what's out there. We understand the task that God has given us. We live in a real world. It's dirty and it's messy and it's broken. And God has called us to it. Look at verse 16. <clears throat> the city officials did not know I had been out there or what I was doing, for I had not yet said anything to anyone about my plans. I had not yet spoken to the Jewish leaders, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or anyone else in the administration. But now I said to them, you know very well what trouble we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. Let's rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and end this disgrace. 
Then I told them about how the gracious hand of God had been on me and about my conversation with the king. They replied at once, yes, let's rebuild the wall. So they began the good work. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem, the Arab, heard of our plan, they scoffed contemptuously. What are you doing? Are you rebelling against the king, they asked. And I replied, the God of heaven will help us succeed. We, his servants, will start rebuilding this wall. But you have no share, legal right, or historic claim in Jerusalem. Here we are, and this is what I want you to get. Nehemiah understood the balance between trusting God and getting to work. He understood the balance between trusting God and getting to work. You see it twice, verse 18 and verse 20. They said, the gracious hand of God is on us. So they began the good work. They didn't say, hey, this is God that's told us to do this. He's going to make it happen and then go home. They knew God's hand was on them, and they began the work. They got to work. I feel like when I look back over the past months and years, sorry, And think about all the things that we have talked about when we have been here together. I feel like we have a pretty strong, clear understanding of who God is here at Mossbrook. We have a pretty good grasp on the infinite power, the unlimited wisdom, and all of the resources that our great God has. We talk about that a lot. I feel like we're pretty solid on that. But I want you to understand that if we're going to do what God wants us to do, if we're going to accomplish as a church what God wants us to accomplish, that there comes a point where we have to get off our butts and get to work. You see what I'm saying? This is great. I look forward to it every week. But this is not enough. It's not enough for us to just get together and talk about who God is. We need to take that knowledge of His resources and His call on our lives, and we have to get up and out and do it. We have to have both. You see, answering God's call in your life must be a combination of faith and action. It must be. Let me ask you this. Where are you in your life? Are you a Christ follower? Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? If you don't, He is calling you to that relationship. He wants that with you. There is no doubt in my mind. If you are a Christ follower, you want to serve God, you want to do something, but you are fearful, let me tell you something. So is Nehemiah. So am I sometimes. Sometimes I am fearful of the cost. But that is what God has called us to. You know, when I think about where we sit at this point as a church and where I sit often in my life, and maybe you, if you're honest with yourself this morning about where you are, I realize that my problem is self-focus. And God calls like He did for Nehemiah and like He did for Jonah. And you have two choices. You can see the monumental task and you can look at yourself and say, 
What can I do? What can I figure out? What can I afford? What can I accomplish? Or you can look at God and you can say, what can God do? What can God figure out? What can God afford? What can God accomplish? Who are you focused on right now in your life, yourself or God? At the end of the first week when Tim was talking about Nehemiah chapter 1, right at the end, he ended with a question. Do you trust him? Do you trust God? If so, you need to act. You need to go. You need to move. I found this this week. I thought it was kind of interesting. You may or may not. By the year 2020, the sports apparel industry is going to double in size to $100 billion a year in the U.S. The sports apparel industry. That's good news, right, Penny? Good news for New Balance. Do you know that active sport participation over the same amount of time is supposed to rise about 10%. Did you know that the sale, (laughs) you're going to laugh, but the sale of yoga pants has increased, I'm not lying, I'm not making this up, Wall Street Journal, has increased 45% in the last five years, and active yoga participation has increased 3%. The article interviewed a lady (coughs) on the street who was wearing her yoga pants. And she said, I love it when I put on my exercise gear because when I put it on in the morning, I say to myself, maybe today is the day I should think about exercising. (laughs) There's a difference between saying something, and doing something. I found this quote this week from a a comedian. He said this. Sorry, looking at the wrong page. He said, I have a lot of beliefs, and I live by none of them. That's just the way I am. They're just my beliefs. I just like believing in them. I like that part. They're my little believies. They make me feel good about who I am, but if they get in the way of something I want, I just do what I want to do. And that's what we have to be so careful of as believers, don't we, as Christ followers. We need to make sure they're not just our little believies. They're not just our little pets. This is the way that we live our lives. We're talking about surrender. That's what we've been singing about today. That's what we've been talking about. Laying down our lives, giving God our hearts, that's all he asks, is that combination of faith and action. I want you to trust him, that's what he commands us to do, but we've got to move past that, we've got to act, we've got to do, knowing that God is sending us. Father, we are so thankful for your loving care.